This podcast is brought to you by Podcast Nation. Welcome to As a Woman, Fertility Hormones and Beyond. I'm your host, Dr. Natalie Crawford, and I am a board-certified OBGYN and fertility physician and also co-founder of Fora Fertility in Austin, Texas. With the goal of educating and empowering women, each week on this podcast, I discuss health and fertility and how they relate to your true self. Become a part of the community of collaboration that amplifies others as a woman. I hope you enjoy the episode. Hi, friends. Welcome back to the As A Woman podcast. I am Dr. Natalie Crawford, and I am so excited to have you on today to talk about something near and dear to my heart, and that is nutrition and fertility. I have always been really interested in nutrition and just the idea that our body is one being. And this makes sense that the things you put in it matter to how your cells function including your eggs, your sperm, and overall your reproductive potential. So if you have listened before, you know that overall I'm an advocate for what science supports as a healthy fertility diet. That is one full of whole foods, which means fruits and vegetables, whole grains, not refined carbohydrates, not sugars, limiting red meat, doesn't have to eliminate all meat, but definitely fish or poultry is a better option based on studies than red meat. But something that is always controversial anytime there is a YouTube video or an Instagram post or a podcast talking about nutrition is soy. And I want to break down why this is so confusing. But before we jump into all of that, let's start with fertility in the news. So recently, Oklahoma signed the nation's strictest abortion ban. And you probably have heard about this, but I've been getting asked many questions about what this means and what the impact is for people who could get pregnant or those who want to undergo IVF. Their governor was quoted in saying, I promised Oklahomans that as governor, I would sign every piece of pro-life legislation that came across my desk. And I am proud to keep that promise today. This bill specifically bans termination of a pregnancy after conception, which is defined as fertilization in this bill. It is specifically saying the word termination, so it is not believed that this bill would prohibit IVF, although there's uncertainty about what the word termination means. We don't believe it means discarding embryos or freezing them, although that might be left up for interpretation. This bill does have a few exclusions. It's okay to remove a dead unborn child caused by spontaneous abortion, what we call a missed miscarriage. It's also okay to remove an ectopic pregnancy, which can be potentially life-threatening, when an egg and sperm meet in the fallopian tube, and that's where implantation occurs. The law does not apply to plan B, like the morning after pill. And so overall, the law is okay if it's saving the life of the pregnant woman, or if the pregnancy is a result of rape or incest. That has been reported to law enforcement. Some of the scary things about the bill, in addition to limiting access to reproductive care for people all over the state, it's also that there is a bounty hunter-ish provision, meaning the penalty, it's a felony to perform an abortion, punishable by up to 10 years in prison. And citizens, private citizens are allowed to report people who they believe have either assisted somebody in obtaining an abortion or performed an abortion. And they are allowed to turn them in very much like SB8 here in Texas. This means that Oklahoma has essentially banned abortion in almost all circumstances. Two out of the four states abortion clinics have now already closed and the other two probably will soon. This means it's going to be harder for people in the state of Oklahoma to get appropriate reproductive care. Remember that abortion means many things. It's the end of a pregnancy. This can be done to save the life of the pregnant person for many different reasons. It can be that you simply do not want to be pregnant or this is a safe or dangerous situation. It could be a medical situation. But there are also many pregnancies that are highly desired that need to have a termination, either because of genetic abnormalities, birth defects, situations where carrying the pregnancy might prohibit the person from getting pregnant again. There's more circumstances than one person could actually imagine. And unless you or somebody you love have been in that scenario, you probably don't understand to the full extent how a law like this endangers people. 
What we also know is that before abortion was legalized, many people died from illegal abortions, whether it was from bleeding or infection. When abortions are done in unsafe and illegal circumstances, that means that people are not going to get appropriate health care. And when we have a way to make this a safe and effective procedure without endangering somebody's life, it's very hard to watch us turn back the clock to before 1973 when Roe was first passed and reproductive rights were considered a human right. I know that personally, as a fertility doctor, I'm scared about if Roe gets overturned, what it means for IVF. Oklahoma's bill is an example of a bill that, depending on exactly what word is used and how it is phrased, could be used to argue that IVF should be illegal or that IVF as we know it, which is overall safe and effective, would need to be performed in a different way, making it less safe or less effective, taking people longer to get pregnant, not allowing them to freeze or do genetic testing of their embryos. Therefore, if they don't get pregnant, they have to do another cycle, limiting the number of embryos that potentially could be created because of not being able to freeze them and needing to transfer them all, therefore making the risk for multiple pregnancy and further pregnancy complications even higher. And also, it means that you won't be able to maximize your ability to get pregnant per cycle. We think about IVF, how we've made it so successful compared to when it was first around. Remember that IVF is newer than Roe, meaning IVF came to existence in a Roe-protected world. We really were able to garner success when we didn't have to rely on natural ovulation, when we were able to utilize gonadotropins, medications that mimic hormones made from the brain, in order to get one month's group of eggs all to grow forward. When we were able to get multiple eggs grow forward at once, we were able to take them out of the body and fertilize them in the lab. When we can do this, what then happens is we're able to grow out many more embryos than we'd see in a natural cycle, potentially freeze them for future children or pregnancies, or if this cycle is not effective, or do genetic testing if perhaps there is aneuploidy or an increased rate of genetic abnormalities in case you carry a genetic disease or a translocation, which is when chromosomes switch spots. IVF is used for so many different reasons. We've been so lucky that technology has made this process accessible to more people. And even though it's still expensive, it's overall effective. That may not be the case if some of these laws are defining personhood at fertilization or conception and embryos are granted rights of people. Can we freeze them? Can we biopsy them? Can we thaw them? What rules and restrictions are going to be in place? Truly, it's all a hypothetical world we don't know, but we are watching bills like this very closely at the state level. Okay, well, on to the topic at hand, soy infertility. Before I dive into this, I just want you to know that I am vegan. I think that's an important disclaimer. We are plant-based here, but that does not mean that I've always been this way. It's certainly something that I've come to over my life. This is my personal choice that is the healthiest way to be and how I choose to eat. However, I don't enforce this on my patients. We talk about healthy foods and diets in general. Certainly, I eat soy, but I want you to be aware of the data that's out there so you can make your own claims. This is one of the top things I hear about when I talk about fertility diets or being vegetarian or vegan is, well, you can't have soy that's bad for you. And I think that overall blanket statement scares a lot of people and allows there to be so much noise when it comes to the nutrition and data space, especially in the sphere of fertility. So today I want to break down what we know about soy and fertility and reproduction and your cycle and your hormones so that you can make the decisions that's right for you, no matter what that is. Okay, so let's dive into where this all comes from and what you do need to know. There are so many people out there who will tell you that soy is bad for you, that it is a phytoestrogen and it is bad for your fertility. And, you know, too long don't read version is that that's just false. Both female and male studies have shown that soy is not harmful and in fact may be beneficial in certain circumstances. So if you don't want to listen to the rest of the podcast, you got the take home but if you want to understand why this is the case and why there's some controversy over soy so that you can be educated about what it is, how it works, and why this matters for your body, listen on. We are going to talk about the reproductive system largely gearing towards periods, hormones, fertility, IVF in women, and then also just touching on men and sperm samples. So let's dive in.
So soy is in many foods. It's very common in Southeast Asian countries, part of cuisine, such as tofu. So there's a lot of soy in tofu and some other products, especially for vegetarians and vegans. Overall, let's take fertility out of the picture. Studies have consistently shown that soy consumption is protective against cardiovascular disease, it lowers cholesterol, protective against blood pressure elevations, and in the prevention of cancer and diabetes. It also can be helpful in management of long-term menopausal symptoms. So overall, that all sounds really beneficial. So why does soy get a bad rap? Well, the truth is that soy contains many things called phytochemicals. These are things that have activity in the body And many of them are antioxidants. So antioxidants are good things. We've heard of antioxidants. Antioxidants help combat inflammation and they help us get rid of things called free radicals and other things that are damaging our body. So the antioxidant property of soy is really part of why it's considered effective in these circumstances. So that's a huge part of soy, things that are anti-inflammatory and things that are antioxidants. However, Soy is also something called an isoflavone, and isoflavones are non-steroidal compounds, and they have a structure that is similar to the estrogen that your body makes. And for this reason, you will often hear soy called a phytoestrogen. Soy is not the only thing that has isoflavones. There are lots of other things as well that can be phytoestrogens. However, let's just talk about soy in this context. Now, these phytoestrogens act on the body in something called CIRMs. CIRMs are selective estrogen receptor modulators. And these are the receptors for estrogen that have both agonist and antagonist effects on the estrogen receptor, depending on where it's binding in the tissue. You've heard of other CIRMs. This is not a crazy thing. Clomid is example. Clomid is a medication that you take that is a CIRM. It binds to certain estrogen receptors. It blocks them. The brain interprets that that estrogen receptor is full, sends out a higher signal of FSH to help grow and act to ovulate. One of the negative consequences of Clomid is that it can bind antagonistically, meaning in a negative way, to the estrogen receptors inside the uterus. So we know that our body has estrogen receptors, and we know that things that modulate those receptors are called CIRMs. And there's different types of receptors, alpha receptors and beta receptors that do different things. And isoflavones have been shown to sometimes be estrogenic, sometimes anti-estrogenic or even neutral, depending on where it is impacting and in what circumstance. So this has led to some people thinking that soy may have a beneficial effect because it helps combat extra endogenous estrogen, which we know is made from fat cells or in certain conditions like PCOS. And then also it has antioxidant effects and that is highly beneficial when there's inflammation or other disease-based processes. However, do we need to be concerned about this potential CIRM interaction and at what level do we get worried about that? I understand why people are confused about this. I'm not going to go over every study in detail because that's not why you listen to the podcast. I'm going to give you the high-level bullet points. But my disclaimer, as I always give when I talk about nutrition-based studies, nutrition and diet is very hard to study in human-based populations because we cannot fully control one's diet. We can add things, we can subtract, we can observe, we can monitor prospectively in the future. However, we can't control every variable. So there's always some limitations in the data that we're getting, and we just have to be aware of them. One huge one. So any of these studies that we talk about when we start talking about observational-based studies where there was no modification made is that in general, people who tend to eat a lot of soy, aka tofu or other soy-based products, typically are vegetarian or vegan. They also then consume a higher quantity of fruits and vegetables. They're not adhering to the standard American diet. Therefore, there may be other things that they are consuming as well, both good or bad, that could be changing the results here. So we just have to acknowledge there could be some selection bias because what we are studying is associated with people who overall eat different things. Let's also remember that the word fertility is often defined different in studies. Most people are actually talking about fecundity, having a child versus not having a child. And fecundity is probability of having a child per cycle. But overall, when we talk about this, they are generally looking at people who have children versus people who have not been able to have children. But sometimes we look at other parameters or endpoints or outcomes in different studies. So you could look at 
menstrual cycle changes, ovulatory changes, positive pregnancy tests, hormonal levels. So remember that every study is a little bit different. So I'm going to break down a few basic categories and the studies that exist, and then we'll summarize this up. I'm not going to go into tons of detail about each study because I don't want to bore you to death, but I do want you to understand where this information is coming from and that this is evidence-based medical science here. So let's look at some fertility-based studies, understanding these might mean anything from live birth to positive pregnancy tests. So in 2005, we had a study published looking at a six-month clinical trial in Japanese women with secondary amenorrhea or anovulation, meaning they used to ovulate, but now they don't. There were only 36 women in the trial, so it was very small. Six grams of black soybean powder were given to the intervention group, and nothing was given to the control group. After the period of intervention, four people became pregnant and 12 people showed ovulation improvements based on ultrasound monitoring in the intervention group. And the improvements in ovulation were only seen in two people from the control group. So this was promising, but it's a pilot study. It was small, it was not randomized, and these outcomes have not been shown, but looked like improvement in ovulation and pregnancy rate with supplementation of soy. There was also a longitudinal cross-sectional study, meaning looking at people at one point in time, and this was in over 11,000 American women aged 30 to 50 who participated in the Advent Health Study. This is an Advent Health Church, a community with lots of vegetarians and vegans, so 54% lacto-ovo vegetarian, meaning okay with dairy and eggs, and 7% vegan, meaning no animal products at all. Based on this study, there was a high consumption of soy, so 94% of all people, and there was an inverse association between intake of soy and live birth, so a 3% decrease in live birth rate. This study just used a food questionnaire and was looking at one time, so the study made people a little curious if too much soy could be bad for you in some ways. In a prospective cohort study, a little better style study in 2012, this was an observational study of 323 Canadian women who were at least 35 and older, who were followed from the second month of pregnancy until delivery. Soy was looked at in their amniotic fluid and compared to how much they intake. And there was no significant association between soy intake or phytoestrogen intake in the amniotic fluid and any complication in the pregnancy or any history of infertility. Limitation of the study is less than a third of people actually consumed soy or gave information on soy. And so this might not be the best population to study the impact that soy might have. So in a subsequent prospective study, there were 471 healthy American women who were followed for 12 months and the urinary levels of isoflavones were quantified and fertility was looked at in a time to pregnancy fashion. So this study showed higher urinary levels of soy breakdown was associated with a shorter time to pregnancy. So it suggested that it improved fertility or you got pregnant faster. However, limitation in this study is that urinary levels has not necessarily been correlated with dietary intake, although it might make sense. But urinary levels may reflect more of a short-term measurement of recent soy ingestion instead of an overall consistent dietary pattern. So let's look at another study. Over 7,000 healthy American or Canadian women were looked at two cohort studies that followed people for 12 months or until pregnancy. So another time to pregnancy study and people trying to get pregnant. The dietary intake of isoflavones in this study did not appear to be associated with fertility in these cohorts. Okay, so in most of these observational studies, soy intake appears net neutral on fertility outcomes. There's no consistent pattern and there's confounding factors or limitations of each study. And the only study, which again was a pilot study and very small that was investigational, you intake this, you do not intake this, there did appear to be a benefit of potentially consuming soy in that way. When looked at hormonal patterns or changes in people who have PCOS, overall it appears that there's no huge association between fertility and soy consumption in women with PCOS, but there is a trend towards improvement of hormonal values and ovulation, and we do need more studies to confirm this. But this is suggestive that these vegetable-based protein sources are conducive to an ovulatory environment in PCOS women, which also supports the work that Shavaro has done in the Nurses Health Study, looking at ovulatory factors where you had a higher intake of vegetable protein over animal protein sources, having an increased trend towards ovulation. So these studies have all been in 
natural observational fashions, people trying to get pregnant naturally. When we look at IVF or assisted reproductive technology studies, I always find these to be very insightful because we're controlling for more variables. People aren't just like out in the wild. You don't know if they're having intercourse on the right day. These are cycles where you're controlling a lot and definitely trying to get to that optimal pregnancy rate. Okay, so there was a study that was looking at women who were undergoing IUI And this study, there were 134 people in it, and one group was given soy for up to 10 days prior to beginning the cycle. These people all had infertility for at least two years. They were all treated with Clomid, and they had IUI, and the other group was not treated with anything. There were significant increases in hormone levels, FSH, LH, estradiol in the intervention arms. The endometrial thickness was improved in the intervention group compared to the placebo. The intervention group had a lower rate of miscarriage, which was statistically significant, and a higher rate of pregnancy that was statistically significant when compared to the placebo. So soy intake before IUI cycles improved both endometrial thickness response, your chance of getting pregnant, and decreased your chance of a miscarriage. All sounds good to me. Now, this could be because these cycles were all treated with Clomid. Clomid, as we said earlier, is another CERM, and one of the negative impacts of Clomid can be a thinning of the uterine lining, which may impact ovulation. So if soy helps thicken the lining, that might improve implantation and thus pregnancy and dropping miscarriage rates. So it might actually be that in this study, the soy intake was combating one of the negative effects that we see with Clomid. Super interesting. Okay, so a very similar study pattern was then looked at in people who are undergoing IVF. So 213 infertile women undergoing IVF And prior to embryo transfer, they all had intramuscular progesterone, standard of care treatment. And so some were given soy and some were given placebo. So now we're trying to see, was it just the Clomid or is it something else? The treatment with soy significantly increased the implantation rate. So 25% versus 20%. Higher rate of pregnancy, 39% versus 21%. Higher chance of pregnancy to delivery ratio, meaning a lower chance of miscarriage. There was no difference in embryo quality, number of eggs, fertilization, any of that. But really important to know in both of these studies, a dose of soy was given at 1,500 milligrams a day, and that's not usually achieved by diet. And so this was a pharmacological intervention. But what we do feel based on these studies is soy is not harmful in either of these. IUI cycles or IVF cycles, we saw improvement only and not a negative side effect in these cycles undergoing fertility treatments. Well, let's look at observational studies and trying to quantify amount of soy in the actual diet. So there was a study in 2015 by Venegas of a 315 USA women who were undergoing IVF cycles. And what we saw was There was a correlation between dietary soy intake and improved fertilization rates, pregnancy rates, and live birth rates upon people who consumed soy versus those who did not. Live birth rate was 44% versus 31%. Very significant. People were divided into four categories, quartiles, which we often think about here. You consume nothing, zero, and then one, two, and three, kind of the tertiles of soy intake, the lowest one-third intake, the middle one-third, and then the top one-third. Live birth rates was highest with people in the second and the third quartile as compared to people who did not consume any soy. So definitely, again, showing potential benefit and certainly no harm with soy intake and in these people in IVF studies. Okay, so a study that I love, so Shavaro et al., Shavaro does a lot of the nutritional research, prospective cohort study, best type of study we can do besides a randomized control trial, looked at 239 American women undergoing assisted reproductive technology, meaning IVF. There was an association between pregnancy outcomes and urinary BPA. So we know about BPA as a toxin that often comes from plastics, and this was dependent on soy consumption, meaning what we think about this is that implantation Live birth rates and pregnancy rates were all higher among soy consumers without dependence on BPA quartiles as compared to people who had higher BPA levels and did not consume soy, meaning we believe there is a protective effect of consuming soy against the fertility disturbance that has been shown with BPA exposure. 
Y'all, this is huge and really, really important because we know that environmental toxins play a much bigger role in our fertility and our health than we are aware of. So anything we can do to combat this is huge. A lot of these studies excluded male factors, so I think it's important to add on that in a study that was looking at male intake of soy, because one of the things that I hear a lot is that, oh, phytoestrogens, that can be bad for a man, that can lower testosterone, that can impact sperm parameters. So in a study that was looking at the intake of soy foods and isoflavones in men undergoing IVF, it was unrelated to fertilization rates, quality of embryos, embryo cleavage, implantation, clinical pregnancy, or live birth rate. So even when we say, does soy impact sperm and how sperm functions when it comes to IVF, because we really get to see when that male genome kicks in and how the embryos do, there was no decrease in sperm quality, implantation, and pregnancy rates, any of those variables, even when men consumed more soy. So I think that is an important factor overall. How I take all of this is to say that it appears soy is definitely not harmful to the diet. We can argue if these studies have enough statistical significance to say that it is helpful. Should everybody be recommended to take soy? Maybe, maybe not. But what we can say is that anybody who tells you that soy is harmful for your fertility is not giving you the latest evidence that's out there and is purely telling you something that is wrong. So whether you personally choose to consume soy or not is going to be your own preference. I, again, advocate for a whole foods-based diet. Does that mean you have to eat like I do? Absolutely not. But here is exactly what I tell my patients who are undergoing IVF or fertility. A diet high in fruits and vegetables is absolutely going to be the best for you. Fruits and vegetables have lots of good vitamins, nutrients, and there's things that you can't get from other forms. Whole grain carbs for most people are huge sources of fiber and they're very good for you. If you have celiac disease, you should avoid gluten. Or if you have an autoimmune disease and you've been directed to avoid gluten, then of course, follow your doctor. But I see so many people being told they should just avoid gluten overall from a fertility standpoint. And there's not evidence of that either. We also have no evidence that you need to be keto and totally carb-free. That might be a helpful weight loss strategy for some people, but that's not in the fertility diet scheme. Meat is the most controversial of everything. We'll do a podcast episode talking about meat specifically, but the take home is the more vegetable-based protein sources you can take, it appears better. And red meat on its own, when you isolate out different meats, appears to be the one that is most harmful for embryo development or IVF outcomes. So I do recommend that people limit. I never fully say avoid, but I usually say a limit. Here's the take home that I give to my patients. Try to cut out processed foods, added sugars, fried foods, and things that you know that you don't need. Try to have Meatless Monday. By nature of making it Meatless Monday, you're going to have to become more creative and intake those vegetables to not be starving. Your other days of the week, try to have meat in just one serving a day. So if you have breakfast, lunch, and dinner, have a good healthy salad for lunch, have some oats for breakfast, and then, you know, have your meat with dinner if you want. And try to limit red meat to one meal a day. What we do know from all the data we just reviewed is that you should feel fine having soybeans, tofu, tempa, other sources of soy-based protein. You should not feel like you need to stray away from those based on your hormones or your PCOS or because you're undergoing fertility treatment. And in fact, there's potential benefit from consuming soy due to some of these antioxidants or anti-inflammatory effects. And we do know that it counters toxins such as BPA. I know this was a science-backed podcast talking about lots of studies here, but I just wanted you to get a feel of why, even though this is a controversial topic, I feel so passionate about it is fine to consume soy. Nutrition is one of my passion projects. I was a nutrition major in college, and I've always, always loved it and always felt like we've got one body and what we put into it must matter. So if there's other nutritional-based topics you'd love to see on here, please send us a message. You can always reach us at the As A Woman Podcast on Instagram at As A Woman Podcast. Also, let's dive into FFS for fertility sake. These are your fertility questions that you are asking on my Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD each and every week. We are going through and choosing some of the most interesting or top asked questions and answering your questions here each week. The question box is usually posted on Monday, so follow along and ask your questions and then stay tuned to see if we answer them here. All right, question number one. Should uterine polyps be removed prior to embryo implantation? 
Absolutely. So this is thinking about IVF. After you've gotten those good embryos, you want to make sure that the uterus is the best environment possible to receive that embryo. Every clinic's a little different here, so you need to understand what your clinic's protocol is. I have always practiced in the world of checking the uterus with a saline sonogram, meaning putting water into the uterus and looking with ultrasound prior to doing an embryo transfer. And part of this is because I want to make sure there's no polyps. Polyps are benign projections of endometrial tissue that are inside the uterus. However, they can cause some inflammation and they can also prevent implantation. You just went through IVF and worked very hard to get your embryos. And we want to do absolutely everything possible to make that embryo implant. So make sure you are checking your uterus. And if polyps are found, absolutely, you want to go get them checked out. Question number two. PGTA tested embryo resulted in a blighted ovum. Why does this happen? I wish I had tons of information here, but the take home message IVF has come such a far way. Genetic testing of embryos highly helps us select the embryos that have the highest potential. They are not perfect embryos, meaning genetics are not everything. An embryo still has to have potential, cells have to divide, organs have to form, it has to give feedback to the body. So when I see a blighted ovum after a PGTA, which is the genetic testing for aneuploidy with IVF, I tell my patients, your body did what it was supposed to hear. Something in this embryo was not signaling the right feedback to form an actual embryo. The cells weren't dividing right, so that embryo didn't form. Even though it is such a devastating loss, this is a better outcome than that pregnancy getting further along and realizing that the baby's not developing normally. It is unlikely to happen again, and that's what you can feel good about, even though we usually say that the live birth rate on average for a genetically normal embryo is about 65%. So that number kicks the butt out of natural conception rates, but that's not 100. And so embryo competency is another huge reason why. Question number three, does a shorter cycle, such as 24 to 25 days, have a higher risk of preventing implantation? Overall, no, with a huge asterisk here. Meaning, when are you ovulating in the cycle? In general, you should usually ovulate about 12 to 14 days before you get your period. So in this, if you're ovulating around cycle day 10 to 12 and you have a 24-day cycle, then I'm not worried that anything's wrong in your luteal phase. However, if you know you're ovulating on cycle day 16 and you're getting your period on cycle day 24 and your luteal phase is only eight days long, then I'm more concerned that you might have a higher chance having an implantation problem because perhaps there's not enough progesterone or the lining hasn't gotten to the right stage. And I'd want to see if there's any ovulatory factors or anything else going on. Another huge thing to think about is sometimes we see shorter cycles as the only clinical sign of having a lower ovarian reserve. We know that ovarian reserve drops typically with age, but I have young patients who also have a low ovarian reserve. So if you say, wow, my cycles used to be 28, 29 days, now they're 23, 24, please go get checked out. Get an AMH blood test drawn, see a fertility clinic or your OBGYN. That's something that you'd rather have that data now instead of waiting until it is too late. Question number four. Will working out and calorie restricting for weight loss while trying to conceive decrease success? Maybe, maybe not. So let's answer this in a little bit better. Working out. Overall, working out is fantastic. We really love to see patients, especially who are lifting weights and getting stronger or who are doing moderate sustained cardiac activity. That is fantastic for your body. And that's going to prepare you for pregnancy. Muscle mass is going to help you lose weight even faster. What we don't love to see is people who are calorie restricting so much and doing tons of high intensity exercise that their body is so stressed. This potentially could cause such high cortisol levels. It could stress you out. It could also get to a point where you're calorie restricting so much that you might stop ovulating. So we want slow and steady weight loss if you're trying to lose weight to conceive. We don't want you to be rapidly losing weight while you're trying to conceive. If you are overweight and you want to lose a significant amount of weight, the best thing to do is to not try for a small amount. If you are being put on a medical diet, that's going to include a lot of calorie restricting or something like that. The next question, is there anything I can do to help letrozole be more effective? This depends on how you're using it. I'm going to presume for the sake of the question that we are using letrozole for ovulation induction. When you use letrozole in this form, it's also called Femara, it is working by decreasing your natural estrogen levels. When you do that, 
the brain senses, hey, there's less estrogen around, and it sends out a naturally stronger signal of FSH or follicle stimulating hormone. When more FSH is sent out, then hopefully you're going to get a follicle response to get an egg to grow. Overall, what we think of are those healthy eating patterns that I described above are going to help. We want to be as less stressed as possible. So we don't want to be overloading our body with work and extra things when you can help it. We also want to be sleeping. Probably the number one thing you can do to combat stress or to help your body function is to sleep better. And that's probably the thing that so many of us do so poorly. So really prioritize sleep. Say no to going out with your friends. Really try to put your body into a good place where that brain is not prohibited from responding in any way, meaning it can clearly send out an increase of FSH because it's not too overwhelmed from so much stress. All of that being said, I like to just view that as being healthy. Try to be as healthy as possible. Go on walks, exercise, eat healthy, try to sleep. None of that is magic fairy dust that can help you get pregnant. If there was, we would tell you, oh, you need to eat this or do that or take this supplement. All of that stuff we would 1000% do. For the most part, everybody's body has a different threshold where what dose of letrozole will work and won't work. And the best thing you can do is really ask your doctor, how are we monitoring if this is going to work to set your road of expectation? Are you getting ultrasounds? Are you checking a progesterone level? Are you checking ovulation kits? Are you just waiting and seeing if you get a period? How are you going to know if it's working or how are you going to know if you need to get to a higher dose? Setting the expectations for the cycle is something you actually can control and that's going to help you tolerate it all better. I hope this was helpful for you. Remember that you can ask your questions for For Fertility's Sake each week on at Natalie Crawford MD on Instagram. We will be choosing from the top questions asked and answering them here. Thank you all for listening to As a Woman. It would mean so much if you could rate, review, and follow the podcast to be notified of new episodes every Sunday. I hope you learned something new, and I hope you share it with someone in your life. Be sure to follow along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD, and check out the YouTube channel Natalie Crawford MD. If you're interested in becoming a patient, you can also follow Fora Fertility. I'm so thrilled to have you here, part of the community that amplifies others as a woman. My name is Len Webb. And I'm Vincent Williams. We'd like to welcome you to our documentary podcast, The Class of 1989. Over the course of six episodes, Vincent and I will examine the importance of six black films that came out in 89 and how they shape and influence popular culture, filmmaking, and society in general. Come on, sucker. Let's get it on. New episodes will begin running weekly on March 6th. 